Although UECG Metro East, peace to all of you. Today we live in a culture increasingly obsessed with taking selfies. You know, me, me, me. Collecting views, likes, and of course, followers and subscribers. Whereas superstars used to be those who make it to the big screen, Hollywood, movies. Nowadays, they sit in front of their computer screens, churning out content for other people's screens. Viral has become the in thing everyone's hoping to achieve. And many have, but many more want it. Children nowadays, their ambition is to be YouTubers or vloggers, no longer being doctors or teachers or policemen. But what is it doing to us as a society? Or perhaps it's just a reflection of our tendency to want to feel important, to be noticed. It's a me-centered world, but sometimes our approach to this may not be as obvious. We may choose to be more subtle about wanting people to notice us. But this ten tendency towards wanting attention, towards pride, is not a modern invention. It's been around since the beginning of time, and our story today is just such a story. There are many interesting stories in the Bible, stories of people, good and bad. Of the many stories in the Bible, surely today's story would rank among the most unusual stories. In a way, it reminds us of Job's story. Being up, then going way down, then going up again, higher than before. It starts with the lead character relaxing comfortably and enjoying himself. He was at ease and prospering. All was well. After all, he was King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon. He was rich and very powerful, among the most powerful kings of that time. But this Nebuchadnezzar, he is actually the same one who had the dream about the giant statue in chapter 2. That was apparently 30 years ago. He was also the same king who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace in Daniel chapter 3, and he saw them rescued from the flames. Yet even after this incident, he hadn't learned his lesson. Daniel chapter 5 verse 20 tells us, His heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly. But God cared about Nebuchadnezzar. He gave him another chance, teaching him a lesson he would never forget for the rest of his life. That's why we have this chapter, chapter 4. It's Nebuchadnezzar's story in his own words. Let's bow our heads in prayer before we go on. Let's pray for ourselves. Pray for the people around us, the other people listening to this worship, and pray for me as I share God's word to you. Father God, indeed, please work in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar, God shook him from his comfort zone for his own good. As mentioned, he was at ease and prospering. Let's be honest, this is a situation we would all want to be, for, to be in for ourselves. 
We want to be at ease. We want everything to be going smoothly. No bumps. Well, things seem to be going well for him. But there was one thing that was really going wrong. He was proud. Very proud. His power and wealth had gotten to his head. He felt he deserved everything. In fact, pride is a form of idolatry. It's worshipping self rather than worshipping God. So God called his attention with this second dream. Like the previous dream, he was troubled by his dream and was unable to sleep. God, God really got his attention. We need to realize not all shaking is bad. Sometimes we need to be given a good shaking to wake us up. How many stories have you heard of people being wakened up and called to come back to God because of the COVID? Do you personally feel that COVID was a wake-up call for you to draw near to God? Perhaps you were already distant from the Lord. Or perhaps you're just not as close as you want to be, as we should be. I hope it is a wake-up wake call for you because it is for me. Nebuchadnezzar knew that great as he was, he didn't have the answer to the question in his mind. What, this, what did this dream mean? So he did what he also did during the first dream. He summoned all the wise men in his kingdom, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers, hoping they could shed light on what he dreamt. Perhaps there were times it worked for him. You know, calling all these wise men and asking them for advice. But if you remember, even during that first dream, none of these wise men could tell him what the dream was, much less its interpretation. In fact, he wanted them all exterminated. But this time, he called on them again anyway. This time, he didn't keep the vision a secret. He told them exactly what he dreamt. But even then, he was still disappointed as none of them could explain to him what the dream meant. Until finally, Daniel comes in. Once again, God uses his servant Daniel to deliver his message to the king. Nebuchadnezzar sought out all kinds of advisors before finally asking Daniel. He could have asked Daniel from the start, but he did not. The king's advisors weren't all that reliable at all. To be sure, once in a while, they gave him the right answer. Other times, they simply gave him the answers he wanted to hear. That's why he kept consulting them. But this time, once again, they were facing a blank wall. He was going to the wrong people. To start with, they were bad counselors who possibly either made up their own answers or else consulted evil spirits for advice. How about us? Whom do we go to when we need advice? Life will bring us multiple different questions. Many people will present themselves as counselors and advisors. But we need to carefully discern which ones we listen to. I'm wondering who among us still seek feng shui masters for advice or astrology. Or perhaps we simply ask friends and relatives when we have issues we need to settle. Or perhaps we even seek professional consultants for advice 
nothing really wrong about seeking friends, relatives, and consultants. But do we seek the Lord? Do we pray to God for His guidance? Or do we wait till the very, very end when there's no, no other options already before we seek God? Upon hearing about the dream, Daniel was alarmed. He knew right away it wasn't good news for the king. The king could see in Daniel's face, in his eyes, that Daniel was alarmed. And the king said, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar wasn't a good king. He could be ruthless and was very much feared. But it seems that Daniel had concern for him, much as God did. Daniel was troubled by the revelation God had given. But upon the king's prodding, he proceeded to give the interpretation anyway. Nebuchadnezzar had become very powerful, so much so that he was known far and wide. Many nations were under his influence so that his dominion reached to the ends of the earth. However, he had become way, way too proud. Thus, God wanted to teach him a lesson. That before a downfall, the heart is haughty. But humility comes before honor. God wanted to bring him down really down before lifting him up again. This dream showed the large, beautiful tree representing Nebuchadnezzar, being chopped down and destroyed, but the stump and roots will be left behind, tied with a band of iron and bronze. In his pride, the king will be brought low and humbled, but he would then be killed. He will then lose his mind, thinking and acting like an ox for seven periods of time, after which he will know that the Most High rules the kingdom of man and gives it to whom he will. Only then will he regain his senses, senses his sanity, and along with it, his kingdom and his glory. At this point, Daniel gives King Nebuchadnezzar an unsolicited advice. Daniel tells the king, O king, please listen to my counsel. Hope this advice is acceptable to you. Stop sinning. Start doing good. And your iniquities, you should stop them. You should show mercy to the oppressed. That there might perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Well, 12 months after the dream, while strutting around in his rooftop and proudly boasting about all he had done, about his accomplishments, about how great he was, God's judgment fell upon him. In Daniel 4.31 it says, While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of man and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like birds' claws. 
can just imagine what he looked like. Medical science has identified the condition King Nebuchadnezzar was struck with, probably as boanthropy. It's the delusion that one is an ox. It's a rare kind of psychological disorder that still exists in modern times. Yes, there are people who have this disease in modern times, but it's rare. God really showed King Nebuchadnezzar that contrary to what he thought, he was actually nothing. Everything he had could be taken from him just like that. He would remain in that state for seven periods of time. It's unclear whether this meant seven years or just seven lengths of time, whatever that length of time was. But it's clear that it was long enough for him to grow hair that was really long and nails that were really long, becoming like a wild animal. In that span of time, he lost everything. His throne, his family, his wealth, power, friends. He lived with the beasts of the field, eating what they ate. Can you imagine what it must be like? Just crawling around on fours, eating grass, together with the other oxen. Though I'm guessing, it must be more difficult for the people around him to see him like that, their king becoming an ox. Because the king doesn't even know what's happened to him. He doesn't know that he's not normal. He thinks he's an ox and that he's doing what he's supposed to. And he's certainly not proud right now. Well, at the end of the days, in verse 34, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever, for His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and He does according to His will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can say, None can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Take note of the sequence of events. Firstly, he lifted up his eyes. Somehow, even in his condition, he was able to do this. Before this happened, his eyes were only on himself. I, me, my, I built all this by my power for the glory of my majesty. I'm so great. Now he knew better and turned his eyes to the Lord. And after he had done this, he regained his sanity. His reason returned. At the same time, as God had promised, his majesty and splendor returned. His counselors and lords sought him out. He was re-established in his kingdom, and even more greatness was added to him. He became even greater than before. God had clearly said that this, you know, looking to him, was the prerequisite 
to him gaining back all he had. He needed to know who was in charge. So when he looked to the Lord, the Lord gave him back all that he had and even more. Yes, his use of pronouns changed completely. Instead of I, me, my, he now switched to he, his, him. Yes, he regained his majesty and splendor, but now he knew where all of it came from. He knew that it was the Most High that had done everything for him. It was not his own doing. It is God who was truly great, not himself. Whereas before he thought no one could question him for what he did. He could do what he wanted as king. But now he confessed that no one is in a position to question God for what he does. God had the right, the authority to do what he wanted, even to humble this great king. And no one can question God about it. Now King Nebuchadnezzar praises, extols, and habitually honors the king of heaven. He openly testifies about God's greatness and God's goodness. Do you realize that this chapter is unique in all the Bible? Why? It's the one chapter that was totally spoken by someone who was a pagan. It's a testimony of one who was made to know God. From start to end, King Nebuchadnezzar was testifying before men about what God had done for him. At this point, it's good to step back and evaluate our own lives. Let's ask ourselves this question. One, are we acknowledging God's authority and power in our lives or are we being prideful? Are we acknowledging God's authority and power in our lives or are we being prideful? Let's take a moment to think through that question. Everything going well doesn't mean that they really are well. It could be that things are going pretty well for you, but let me ask you, are they really well? It took this shaking for Nebuchadnezzar to realize things were not really well for him. And yes, it took the shaking for him to turn to God. Where is God in your life, in my life? Have you truly accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The Bible says that we are all sinners and have fallen short of God's glory. Could it be that you are trusting in yourself, your own goodness, to save you from your sin? That's the ultimate pride. Trusting in yourself for your salvation. The Bible says we can never be good enough in God's eyes. At least not on our own. If you have not turned your life over to God and trusted Jesus alone to save you, don't wait till you're shaken before you choose to lift your eyes to God. Come to Christ now. Receive Him as your Lord and Savior. On the other hand, if you are a Christian, make sure you're not trying to steal God's glory by taking the praise or the credit for the things going well in your life rather than acknowledging His goodness. Is your business or profession or family or schooling going well? then praise God for it. 
Let people know, testify about His goodness. Don't be proud in yourself. Second question. Are you in some sort of great difficulty in your life? Could it be that God is using that to shake you up and cause you to turn back to Him? Could it be you are under God's loving discipline and is waiting for you to lift up your eyes to Him in surrender before lifting you out of your difficulty? Last question. What do you need to repent? King Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson the hard way. Let's not learn, let's not wait till God does the same thing to us before we will learn our lesson. Sadly, King Nebuchadnezzar's successor, Belshazzar, didn't learn the lesson God taught his predecessor. Therefore, he suffered God's judgment. In ending, let me just repeat those three questions for us to think about. First, are we acknowledging God's authority and power in our lives, or are we being prideful? Secondly, are you in some sort of great difficulty in your life? Could it be that God is using that to shake you up and cause you to turn back to Him? Third, what do you need to repent of? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Father God, You, You alone are God not us. We are not even little gods. We are truly nothing before you. We are something only because you take us out of where we were and gave us salvation. Lord, if there is anyone here today who has yet to put his or her faith in Jesus Christ, who has yet to acknowledge you, may that person truly acknowledge you and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. May we no longer be proud in ourselves, being self-dependent. May we truly turn to you in humble submission giving you all the glory. And may we testify, Lord, to other people about your greatness and your goodness in our lives. May we not be ashamed of you, Lord, just as this once pagan king was not ashamed of testifying in your name. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.